Broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota, my name is Sean and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Before we get started, let me take a moment to introduce you to our guest. If you follow Christian blogs and social media, you've no doubt heard of Rachel Held Evans. She's the author of the best-selling book, A Year of Biblical Womanhood, and Rachel and her husband Dan make their home in the Dayton, Tennessee area. Rachel, it's great to have you on for this episode of the Author Talks with Sean Tabbitt podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. The first thing I thought as I was reading your book, writing a memoir in your late 20s is a really gutsy move. How do you know it was the right time to share your story? I don't know if you ever know that for sure, really. And there are times when I have wondered, well, what was I thinking exactly? But I guess I felt like I was asking a lot of questions about my faith. I grew up evangelical and had kind of just entered this kind of scary time of doubt and questioning and rethinking things. And I felt really alone in that journey until I started writing about it on the blog um, and in articles, and when I was able to connect with other people who were experiencing the same thing, just hearing them say, me too, you know, I'm there too, I'm in the exact same place, was just mutually very beneficial. And so I thought, you know, I think it's just time to write this story, and I hope that it's an encouragement to other people, mainly to let them know that they're not alone. And um, yeah, so I thought the time was as right as it could be. I don't know if, you're, if there's ever just the right time to write a book, but it seemed like it was the right time to have this conversation. Well, and one of the things I thought about, especially in the first part of the book, is how much your story is really representative of a lot of the things my wife and I experienced growing up in the church. And I, I think a lot of others who are in their really late 20s into their mid 30s right now are going to kind of relate to that interesting church culture we went through in the 80s and 90s. So the first part of your book, it's called titled Habitat. Share a bit about your early years uh, in which you describe yourself as a fundamentalist. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I grew up in a Christian home and it was a great experience. Went to a Christian school when I was in elementary school and then to a public high school. Went to a Christian college. You know, I was in church every Sunday and every Wednesday. So I was very much immersed in sort of conservative evangelical world. And it was really great for so many reasons. But I was something of a fundamentalist, not so much because of the beliefs that I held, but because of how I was holding them. I was holding them with this sort of death grip, you know. Uh, I have a friend who described fundamentalism as holding your beliefs so tightly they leave fingernail imprints on the palms of your hands. So I was unwilling to change, unwilling to rethink things until I got to college and just had some questions about things like eternal damnation and religious pluralism that just didn't have, I wasn't satisfied with the, the answers I was getting, sort of the neat and tidy answers that I had memorized all my life. And so I guess for me, fundamentalism, like I said, it's not so much about the beliefs that you hold, but how you hold them. And so that experience of doubt and questioning helped me hold my beliefs with a more open hand, sort of in a, almost in a position of surrender to God, because if we're clinging so tightly to our beliefs, we don't leave room or space for even God to come along and change them. So it was a great experience going growing up in evangelicalism, and I still appreciate much about evangelicalism and had wonderful parents who have always been very supportive and encouraging and always gave their girls the space to ask questions and to wrestle with doubts and to explore and, and learn new things. So I felt very supported by them as I went through this. But yeah, so evangelicalism was a great way to grow up. And I just hit a point in my late teens, early 20s, where not everything was lining up anymore. And that kind of forced me to just hold my own beliefs uh, a little bit more loosely in that position of surrender. Your answer is a good segue into our next question, which leads us into the second part of your book, and that focuses on some of the faith-challenging experiences and conversations that came your way. I'd be curious if you'd be willing to share maybe one or two of those experiences that really most challenged you or, or rocked your Christian world as it was at that time in your life. 
I can remember one very, very clearly. It was right after 9-11, and I was in college, and they were the news was showing all of this footage of uh, what life was like for people in Afghanistan, because we were about to go, and, you know, the U.S. was about to invade that country. And so they had pulled up all this footage from this documentary called Behind the Veil, which was kind of an undercover documentary showing what life is like for women in Afghanistan at the time under the rule of the Taliban. And they kept showing this one scene over and over and over again. And it was this, uh, it was of a woman getting pulled out to the middle of a soccer stadium. She, she was covered in the, totally covered in the burqa, those sort of light blue burqas that they wore there. And the stadium was full of people. And this is before 9-11. This was part of this documentary. And she had been accused of adultery. And so they pulled her out to the middle of the soccer stadium and a, a guard lifted his, a, a member of the Taliban lifted his gun to her head and fired and killed her and executed her there publicly. And you couldn't see anything because, you know, she's covered in the burqa. So it wasn't necessarily a graphic video, but it was a very disturbing video. And they kept showing it over and over and over and over again in the days after 9-11. And every time I saw it, I got angrier and angrier with God. Because I felt like uh, I, all my life I had been told that not only did this woman suffer incredible suffering and incredible pain in her life, I'd always been told that because she was a Muslim, she also would go to hell. And that how the Taliban treated her in this life is nothing compared to how God would be punishing her for eternity in the next life. And that just raised some big, big questions in my mind about eternity, about salvation, about religious pluralism. And it just, for once, I wasn't asking these questions sort of because I was supposed to ask them and memorize the quick, witty response to return to the atheist. I was asking them myself. And I'd always been told that these are the sort of questions only atheists and unbelievers ask. And here I was asking them and bothering my college professors about them and talking to my friends about them and not feeling satisfied with the answers I was getting. So that's one, that one moment I can look at and say that that was a turning point for me. And I think for a lot of people, when they reach young adulthood and they just get exposed to more of the world and see how different people live, and it, it can throw your own worldview into question. And that's what happened. Well, I think that's something a lot of us go through where, you know, we reach a point where we're out of the house and we're exposed to a lot of new people and new ideas. And at some point, we have to choose to own our faith or, or make a peace with our belief. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us struggle with a lot of the questions you talk about and difficulties you talk about facing in the book, but we're often not honest enough either with ourselves to admit it, or we're afraid to uh, talk to other Christians or people, friends in the church about it, because we're, we're afraid of what they're going to say, what their reaction might be. Yeah. And that's something, too, you have to that was the hardest part really was sort of how people would react to my question. A lot of times they would say, oh, there must be some sort of sin in your life that's making you ask these questions. Uh, are you having sex with your boyfriend? You know, I'm asking about like the fossil record or something <laughs> unrelated. And that would, you know, this has to be the result of pride or what's wrong with your spiritual life. And that can be really discouraging when you feel like you have good questions that you're asking, questions you're struggling with. And it's sort of met with suspicion. But then there are other times when I was less than graceful. It's sort of like when you are experiencing these types of questions, you're so lonely in that journey. You kind of want to drag other people along with you, you know. To, and I, sometimes I tried to, to make people doubt with me, make my friends understand. And so I kind of learned the hard way that, like, a baby shower is not the best time to bring up eternal damnation. You know, not everybody's going to want to talk about that. So I, I made some mistakes myself along the way and uh, in those relationships. But anybody who has had a crisis of faith knows that one of the hardest things about that is relating to other Christians and, and figuring out how to navigate those relationships. Because on the one hand, you want to be understood and loved and still accepted in the church. But on the other hand, you don't want to rock the boat just for the sake of rocking the boat. So that's been a fine line I've had to try to, to navigate this whole time. Well, and in the last part of the book, you talk about change. And really, at, at the start of that, it sounds you were almost at a place where I've heard other people describe it as like your, your faith was deconstructed or th things were somewhat broken down and you had to kind of rebuild. So talk to us a bit about the process of reconstructing your faith. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I thought would just like happen once. <laughs> like, okay, 
So what I used to believe, I don't necessarily believe anymore. I've got some questions about it, and I'm going to tear some of that stuff down, rebuild it. It's really not that clean of a process. It's I feel like my faith is always sort of being deconstructed and reconstructed and then deconstructed again. And it is always subject to change. And at first I resisted that. I really just wanted to figure everything out, find all my answers to all my questions, and then go on my merry way believing the same thing for the next 60 years of my life. But I have this feeling that doubt and questions and change is always going to be a part of my faith. And I'm finally, I think, starting to make make peace with that reality. Uh, but it's, it's not comfortable. It's much more comfortable to sort of just decide what you believe, take with it no matter what sort of new information comes your way. But I, I don't feel like I can live that way and maintain my intellectual integrity, my emotional and intuitive integrity. And so that just means that doubt and deconstruction and reconstruction and change will probably always be a part of my faith experience. The different parts of the book each focus on sort of a different period or different part of your life. If you had to put a label on where your faith journey has taken you since this book first came out a few years back, would it still be change or would it be something else? Yeah, I think it would be, but I think I've got a, yeah, it would still be change. I I still, and also in some sense, sometimes my doubts are are in a sense darker than they once were. I don't know if darker is the right word. I think sometimes I'm struggling with a lot of questions around, I'm struggling with different questions now. I think that's a better way to say it. You know, at first I was questioning, you know, what about eternal damnation and that sort of thing. And, you know, and also gender roles, really strict gender roles that never really made sense to me and in my life. And didn't, I didn't seem to be what scripture was actually teaching. It seemed like we were sort of imposing things onto the text. Now I have a lot of questions about where does God fit into, or how do I understand God when we're talking about a universe that is billions of years old, uh, when we're talking about a universe that is enormous and huge, and, and when there's so many things that we can't explain. And so it's an, I guess in a sense, my questions have just changed. Uh, and so what I'm thinking about and, and doubting and, and rethinking has changed as well. So yeah, I guess I stay in, <laughs> I guess I stay in the change category. And I'm okay with that. I think I, I can't change that. I can't will myself back into certainty as much as I wish I could. I can't. We'll just label that as change part two, I guess, for yeah. you. <laughs> from your perspective as the author, if readers could take only one thing away from Faith Unraveled, what would be the one thing you really hope they'd come away with? I'd want them to know that they're not alone. They're not the only ones asking these questions. They might feel like they're the only one sitting in the pew thinking, is any of this real? Am I making this up? Can this be true? They're not the only one there and in that position because that can be such a lonely feeling. I just want them to know that I've been there too and a lot of other people have too. And then I would also want them to know that God is big enough and loving enough to handle our questions. One thing I say in the book is that serious doubt, the kind that leads to despair, begins not when we start asking God questions, but when out of fear we stop. Uh, I would want people to know that you are safe asking questions that throughout scripture, we see great men and women of God wrestling with God, asking God questions, crying out to God in the Psalms and in Job and all throughout scripture. We see people who have a relationship with God sometimes struggle in that relationship and have questions and that we can trust God enough to ask those questions and we don't have to live in fear. So those would be the two two takeaways I hope people have, just that they're not alone and that God's big enough to handle their their questions. So it's okay to keep those lines of communication open with God, even through doubt. Well, thanks for sharing about that as well. Now, in addition to Faith Unraveled, you've also written A Year of Biblical Womanhood, and you also have another book that's going to be releasing sometime in the near future. Give us a a brief overview of uh, those two books, too. Sure. Uh, well, A Year of Biblical Womanhood was my crazy experiment in biblical literalism. Growing up, I'd always heard about how important it was to practice biblical womanhood, but nobody could seem to agree on exactly what that meant. And most of the time, it was about things that women couldn't do, like preach the gospel or work outside of the home. And it, I had questions about that. I wondered how much was this really coming from Scripture and how much of it was us imposing sort of American cultural values onto the text. And so I thought that a creative way to sort of challenge this idea of biblical womanhood 
was to take a page from A.J. Jacobs, who wrote The Year of Living Biblically, and try A Year of Biblical Womanhood, which meant I followed all of the Bible's instructions for women as literally as possible for the year, sometimes taking them to their very most literal extreme. So that meant I had to, for instance, I followed all of the Levitical purity laws, which meant I had to camp out in a tent during my period and remove myself from the household pretty much entirely and not touch any men. And so that was a little crazy. I had to cover my head whenever I prayed. I had to remain totally silent in church. I submitted to my husband, even with the Netflix queue, which was the hardest thing to submit to him in. And, um, you know, it was really taking notion of biblical womanhood very, very literally to its most literal extreme to make the point that no one is practicing biblical womanhood all the way, that we're all collective in our interpretation and application of scripture, but it's worth asking, why do we sort of pick and choose the way that we do? Why do Christians follow some parts of the Bible and not others? Why are some parts of scripture considered part of biblical womanhood, but others aren't? How do different groups of people think about that? So I did lots of interviews. I spent a lot of time learning from an Orthodox Jewish woman. I went to Amish country. Uh, interviewed a polygamous family just to get a bunch of different takes on what biblical womanhood is. And it was just a really, it was a learning experience. It was a funny, sort of crazy, off the wall, experimental learning experience that I do not recommend anyone else trying. So that was the year of biblical womanhood. And then I just finished writing my next book, which will be called Searching for Sunday. And it's about church and trying to find my place in the church and how other people search for church as well. And it sort of follows the outline of seven sacraments. Uh, not, I'm not making a theological or ecclesiological statement about the sacraments. They're just using it sort of as a literary device. Talking about how important church is, and even to my generation, because of baptism and communion and confession and, and the role those play in our lives and how important they are. So that's, I just finished writing it. I turned it in six months late, <laughs> but it's done. So that will be coming out in the spring of 2015. All right. Well, folks can look for that spring of 2015. And who's the publisher for the new book? Thomas Nelson published both the year of biblical womanhood and it's publishing Searching for Sunday. Well, folks, be on the lookout for that next spring. Rachel, if listeners are interested in connecting with you, learning more about you and your writing, or the best places for them to seek you out on the web? Basically, if you know my name, you can find me. <laughs> my website is rachelheldevans.com. On Twitter, I'm Rachel Held Evans. On Facebook, I'm Rachel Held Evans. So it makes a complete sentence, which is kind of cool, my name. Uh, that's how I check the held there in the middle. So yeah, if you, can, you know my name, you can find me on the internet. And I try to just keep a dialogue open and I try to respond to people when I can. All right. Well, folks, we hope you've enjoyed our conversation today about Faith Unraveled. As Rachel said, if you want to find out more about her and your writing, you can visit her website, which you'll find at rachelheldevans.com. Rachel, thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a lot of fun speaking with you. It was a pleasure. I sure appreciate it. And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbitt. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off. Hey, 